I should probably apologize. Uh, uh, I'm recovering from pneumonia, so it's uh, um, hopefully I won't cough. So <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, my name is uh, Vladik Romanovsky. I'm uh, one of the maintainers of the Kubert project. And today I would like to share some of the progress that uh, Kubert had uh, over the past year, both in terms of uh, features, uh, but also the c community work. Um, for those who are not familiar, um, Kubert is an operator that extends the uh, um, Kubernetes API server to allow users uh, to run virtual machines alongside uh, uh, pods. And uh, this is all uh, using the same uh, familiar Kubernetes API. Um, we run the uh, QMU process that emulates the virtual machine inside a container um, as you would normally do with any other user space application. Um, it's often viewed, uh, Kubernetes is often viewed uh, by some as a replacement for other virtualization platforms. However, um, Kubernetes is significantly much more. It uh, integrates uh, deeply with, uh, um, with Kubernetes and uh, we uh, reuse multiple um, uh, native um, Kubernetes uh, components in Kubert. And uh, Kubert is actually is part of a, a broader a Kubernetes ecosystem uh, where it can be a component in a pipeline or provide uh, a way to craft uh, interesting solutions uh, using it. Uh, one such solution is, uh, uh, is the Kubert provider for cluster API where um, Kubert virtual machines are being used as, as nodes um, for virtual Kubernetes clusters. This was a good year uh, for Kubert uh, um, in general. Lots of different companies were interested in, the, in it. And um, here's a compilation of uh, some that uh, added themselves as, uh, um, as adopters. In terms of community work, um, as Kubert matures, uh, code quality takes the central stage and uh, it becomes a hot topic in, uh, in the community. Uh, this year, we have been also uh, working on evolving our SIGs and uh, creating uh, working groups and uh, sub-projects. And um, this is not just in terms of uh, code separation to different areas, uh, but also we went ahead and uh, created this, uh, these groups of people, um, uh, groups of contributors uh, that are interested in a specific area and will become expert in it, uh, but also they will take responsibility um, for fixing uh, bugs in that area and, uh, and generally maintaining uh, quality there. This step also allows uh, our contributors to evolve within the project. Um, so anywhere from um, being reviewers, um, contributors can become uh, approvers in a specific SIG and then become uh, chairs. Afterwards, um, they can grow in being um, a brute uh, level approver for the whole, um, for the whole project, uh, but also eventually they can grow uh, to become maintainers. Um, this year, we also established our um, feature lifecycle uh, policy, something that we didn't have before. And uh, similar to Kubernetes, uh, new features that are coming into Kubert, um, these would go uh, through um, maturity stages um, from alpha to beta, and then when all the conditions are met, um, these will be, become publicly available. As you know, uh, Kubert, uh, oh, sorry, um, we have also been uh, working on uh, evolving our design proposals, and we still do. And this is uh, not just the, uh, in terms of uh, the mechanics of the design proposals, uh, but also um, uh, we believe that uh, uh, reviewing these proposals uh, and accepting those uh, before the development cycle begins will allow us to create a roadmap and a clear view of uh, features that are, we are committed to deliver by the end of the uh, um, by the end of the development cycle. Um, and uh, this will kind of uh, serve as a priority for, uh, for features um, um, in, in, through this uh, development cycle. Uh, and hopefully that will allow us to, uh, to focus um, contributions and uh, review efforts mainly uh, towards the features that uh, needed the most um, uh, attention. Um, this year, we've also been um, uh, looking at uh, graduation 
And as you know, uh, Qbert is uh, currently in incubation stage. Uh, however, Qbert is already a very mature project. And uh, um, we, it's the second year that we were looking at uh, graduation. However, this year, some more requirements have been added and uh, um, more paperwork is kind of needed from our side. And um, however, we are determined to, uh, to complete this process. Another interesting addition uh, this year was that uh, we started using the DosoBot. DosoBot is an AI platform that, uh, um, allow, uh, that help us with uh, triaging issues. It indexes all of our Git repository, including uh, issues and uh, documentation. And uh, it uh, also serves as uh, kind of a first responder uh, to users where it can uh, point to a link of a resolved issue already. Um, and uh, also point to a piece of documentation. But also there are some interesting anecdotes with it uh, where um, recently a user was complaining about the race condition that uh, he found in, in our code. And DOSOBOT responded with a generated uh, code that actually fixes this, uh, this issue and this was a very pleasant surprise. There are hits and misses and I, I think more misses uh, with it, but uh, as it evolves, I, I hope that it will help us even more. This year, we also had our uh, Qbert uh, Summit. Uh, we have it every year um, for a couple of years now. And it's a virtual summit, and uh, I invite you to follow the QR code to our YouTube page where uh, some, of these, uh, some of the talks are, are captured. And uh, this year, we've doubled the amount of uh, participants. Hopefully, next year, uh, there will be even more uh, interested people. Uh, we also participated this year in, the, in GSOC, it's a Google uh, Summer of Code, uh, and we've doubled the amount of, uh, per, um, of projects and uh, the amount of, um, of mentors, and uh, kudos for everyone who was involved in this. Uh, this year we also had the three uh, releases, and generally we're trying to stick with the uh, uh, Kubernetes release cadence with a slight delay uh, for stabilization. And there are lots of features that uh, have been delivered this year. And uh, I will not go through all of them. I will touch on some important ones uh, in the next slides. But I invite you to follow the QR code for, um, um, to see the um, uh, blog posts about uh, each of them. The last release that was announced a couple of days ago uh, is mainly focusing uh, stabilization. And uh, there were lots of uh, fixes that went into this release. It also focuses on uh, one security concern um, that was raised um, and uh, it comes with alongside uh, some of the small amount of uh, important features as well. One of the uh, features that I would like to touch uh, deeply on is the fact that we have turned our um, the virtual machine object into live updatable. Until um, that change, any change to the VM object uh, would have to be staged and uh, meaning the users would have to turn down their virtual machine and start it over again for these changes to propagate from the VM object to the running instance of the virtual machine. As you can imagine, uh, there are fields on the VM object that don't uh, necessarily require a restart. Um, and we wanted to change that as well. Um, at that time, we also delivered several hot plug mechanisms. Uh, hot plug for CPU and memory, hot plug for um, uh, network interfaces, and a hot plug for um, the disks and volumes. However, all of these uh, um, mechanisms, they had uh, different APIs to them. Uh, some of them were declarative, some were, were imperative using a sub-resource. And we wanted to unify all of this and bring all of these changes together into the VM object. And um, what we've done, we introduced a, a cluster-wide uh, tunable that um, effectively, it turns our VM objects into live updatable. And uh, from there, uh, fields uh, that can be immediately propagated, such as uh, labels and annotation and others, uh, can do so. And uh, changes to CPU and memory, for example, uh, would trigger a hot plug. And uh, other changes that uh, affect, affect the uh, guest ABI, these would still require a restart, and the user would be notified uh, accordingly. Building on this uh, functionality, we also uh, developed a volume migration mechanism uh, this year, and I invite you to uh, follow the QR code to uh, a much deeper conversation on, the, on, the, um, on this feature uh, that, includes, that includes a demo and um, 
uh, a discussion about um, uh, potential use cases. Um, what I will say here is that, uh, as I mentioned before, changes to a VM objects, especially in the area of, of volumes, um, for example, if somebody wants to change uh, the persistent volume claims uh, on the VM, uh, this would trigger a migration. Although there are different strategies on how to react to such change, um, it could be a hot plug or a replacement of these. Uh, we'll focus on uh, migration here. And um, a migration is needed uh, because if you remember the uh, uh, pod objects in Kubernetes, uh, at the moment they are, these are immutable and we cannot simply change the volumes that are attached to, um, um, to pods. Therefore, uh, we need to create a target pod uh, with the new volumes attached to it with a similar spec. And live migration is actually doing exactly that for us. Um, so the flow works in a way that uh, a change on the VM object would be recognized uh, as such, and then the workload updater controller would trigger a migration to create a target pod with the new volumes attached, and then the content of the virtual machine would be transferred from the source pod um, to uh, the newly created one. And um, those uh, who will be uh, mainly interested in this uh, feature are users who are willing to migrate um, or to move their, uh, their VMs from one um, storage class to another. And uh, there are many reasons for doing so. One of which is, uh, is for example, the underlying storage needs to go uh, through maintenance and the administrator wants to move all of these workloads to another storage uh, without, uh, without any interruptions. Another use case, for example, is that uh, uh, some users want to move from block storage to um, uh, file system volumes, and uh, this uh, process allows this as well. Uh, this year, we also have uh, made an important change in, in the, uh, our uh, Verit Handler component. The Verit Handler is the uh, uh, node component, and until recently, it was very powerful. It was able to see all the virtual machine instance objects in the cluster, it was able to process them, and uh, it could also see the node objects and actually change them. And um, even before that change, we already restricted uh, the virtual handler uh, from touching any virtual machine objects uh, that are not uh, that are uh, not running on that uh, specific node where uh, the virtual handler itself was running. And uh, with, the new, uh, with this new change, uh, we introduced a, a validation admission policy that actually prevents a variant handler from, um, from modifying uh, um, node specs. Uh, and we also restricted uh, and prevented from, uh, modif uh, from doing anything uh, to labels and annotations that were not um, uh, owned by Kubert, meaning uh, were put there by other components, for example. Um, during this year, we also uh, developed a, um, another operator um, that solves a fundamental problem in Kubert. And this is an application of where uh, Quota, um, what it does, it uh, presents an alternative way for managing Quota in Kubernetes. And um, the, the fundamental problem that it solves in Kubert is that um, um, it uh, allows us to avoid, um, uh, sorry, I'll say it differently. Uh, the, uh, um, our Kubert system upgrades, uh, they rely on live migration. And this live migration can be blocked easily by, uh, not, enough, by not having enough quota in the system. And um, normally resource quota is being installed in the namespace and it consumes resources uh, and limits uh, resources such as CPU and memory. And um, on the other hand, um, as I said, uh, we perform system upgrades through live migration. And as part of live migration, we create a, a target pod, as I, as I mentioned before, uh, that consumes the same amount of resources as the source pod. And then eventually, uh, what happens is that we, uh, there's a point in time that we consume double the amount of resources that are needed for running a virtual machine. And if there's not enough quota in the system, that target pod cannot be admitted, and eventually, uh, the whole system upgrade and other important operations uh, can fail. So this um, new operator uh, resolves this issue. Uh, another problem that it solves for us is related to the fact that uh, other virtualization um, platforms, they build their users only for um, the virtual resources that they consume. 
and all the infrastructure overhead um, that is um, uh, effectively being uh, introduced uh, by the virtualization stack itself, uh, it's being ignored and has nothing to do with the user. Um, and um, in Kubert, we cannot simply ignore this uh, overhead and we must uh, list it and it's being counted uh, towards uh, the user quota. So this operator solves this problem for us. And it relies mainly on a feature uh, in Kubernetes that was recently introduced. It's called pod scheduling uh, readiness that effectively adds a new field uh, to a pod spec. Uh, it's called the scheduling gate. And when this gate is set, um, the pod will be prevented from scheduling and uh, it will be kind of suspended and, and until the moment the gate is lifted and uh, once it's lifted, uh, the pod will continue scheduling um, to the nodes. And we can rely on this mainly because um, both of our VM creation flow and the migration flow, eventually they create pods. And when these pods are committed to the system, uh, the AQ webhook would add this uh, uh, scheduling gate to them, effectively suspending them. And at that time, uh, the AQ controller uh, would be able to recalculate the quota in the system and um, would check if the uh, suspended pods can fit into uh, the remaining, uh, remaining quota. If they do, the gate will be lifted and these will be uh, scheduled to the nodes. Same way uh, for uh, live migration, when we create this target pod, um, this target pod would be recognized by the application aware quota uh, controller that it's actually being uh, part of uh, already um, um, running a virtual machine. And um, since we don't want to, use, uh, to build the users twice, uh, that target pod will be uh, scheduled to the node immediately, effectively um, unblocking uh, live migrations. Some benefits that we, uh, we get by uh, using this uh, uh, operator, first of all, that uh, we remove a bottleneck uh, from the API server where uh, previously a resource quota was, uh, was calculated. And uh, because we remove this bottleneck, uh, um, the API server can, be, um, can spend more time uh, processing uh, requests uh, than calculating quota. Another benefit is that uh, the API that is coming with the application network quota uh, allow us to see um, a cluster-wide uh, consumption of quota, uh, something that we couldn't uh, get with the traditional uh, resource quota in Kubernetes, uh, where we could see uh, resources uh, consumed uh, only per specific namespace. Another benefit um, that we get uh, with this operator is that it's not necessarily have to work with Kubert at all. It can work with other objects and other operators and that's uh, because we allow uh, cluster administrators to craft their own uh, policies uh, of how they want to uh, calculate quota in the, in the system. And uh, they could easily plug these policies into this operator. In terms of future work, as you see, and we rely quite heavily on live migration. And uh, there are some ideas uh, uh, of how to improve both the speeds uh, of live migration and its uh, reliability. And um, going forward, we are going to invest in that area. Um, over the years, we also uh, removed uh, some of the uh, um, um, uh, so, um, sorry, some of the privileged operations away from uh, the virt launcher pod. A virt launcher pod is the is the one that actually runs the virtual machine. And um, we delegated this privileged operation to our node component that was already privileged. Um, and that allowed us to run this uh, um, the uh, vert launcher pod entirely unprivileged, uh, rootless, and uh, could be completely untrusted component. Uh, but by doing so, we increased our dependency on vert handler uh, actually being present during all kinds of uh, operations such as creation of the VM. And uh, uh, one way to reduce uh, uh, a little bit of this dependency is by using these uh, um, new native components that uh, are being introduced in Kubernetes, such as CI volumes and artifacts. And um, uh, this will allow us to uh, stop using um, dedicated Kubert components, such as container disks, and uh, use these when these will become uh, available and stable in Kubernetes. Um, 
this year, uh, there were some uh, IO thread optimizations uh, work that has been done in, in QMU and Libert. And we intend to um, use this uh, um, and incorporate those into Kubert uh, this year. Uh, another um, a feature that is going to land soon is uh, will allow us, uh, will allow our uh, QD, uh, cluster administrators uh, to migrate workloads uh, to specific nodes. This is something that uh, wasn't permitted uh, uh, previously and uh, now it's going to land uh, soon. Um, we are also looking at integration with DRA, which is the dynamic resource allocation mechanism that is uh, uh, going to be stable soon in, uh, in Kubernetes. Um, our friends from NVIDIA uh, were recently giving a talk about how they envision uh, this integration with the, of the array with Kubert. And um, uh, the benefit that we will get from, uh, from using this, uh, um, uh, from using this uh, mechanism is first of all, um, it will allow us to repurpose some of the hardware that we assign for virtual machines. For example, a GPU uh, that is assigned to a virtual machine on the allocation can be repurposed uh, to use uh, with pods. In the same way we could do with uh, virtual GPUs as well. Another benefit that we get uh, from using this is that uh, the DRA drivers, they are pluggable and um, we can allow our third party uh, partners to, um, uh, to actually develop their own and maintain their own and then uh, simply plug those into, um, back into Kubert. Um, another very critical component uh, for us that has been uh, currently developed in, uh, in Kubernetes and we are eager to, um, to integrate with is uh, Swap. Unfortunately, it uh, didn't come to, uh, a mature, uh, to maturity yet uh, in Kubernetes, but uh, our um, Kubert engineers are actively working in, um, directly in Kubernetes to, um, to stabilize this and to allow this integration to happen. And this will allow um, our virtual machine to have more flexibility um, when they uh, perform, uh, uh, when they consume um, most of the, um, of the resources at the peak of their performance. Um, this is all for me and uh, um, thank you very much for, for listening. I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you. So just wondering, uh, thanks for the sharing the update. Just wondering, um, is there any future work that possibly pro, you know, relevant to networking interface, for example, like a, uh, a way to add multiple network interfaces for VM and not only the default bridge the network inside the VM, sometimes we need to provide directly attached to the kind of VM like other legacy platform in OpenStack or VMware stuff. So I'm just wondering about the networking part. Yes, I, I actually didn't manage the, uh, it's here, but uh, because of like too many, uh, too many things, but in general, Kubert allows uh, um, pluggable, um, pluggable network interfaces. Uh, so an, an interface could be developed as a sidecar and then um, it could be used uh, with, the, with the virtual machine. So the sidecar, it effectively, uh, as it is today, it uh, modifies uh, the underlying um, uh, Libre domain, domain XML and uh, allows an introduction of, uh, of a new interface. But um, we're looking at uh, uh, somehow en enhancing this process and not just uh, modifying the XML, but uh, actually creating an interface and then moving it into the main um, uh, virtual launcher container. You guys are also considering kind of line migration as well regarding that multiple interface, meaning that when, Sorry, I, when I you try to live migrate to those VM that has multiple interfaces and still yes. supposed to be continue to be working, right? So Yes, effectively during live migration, we are creating uh, a, an identical copy uh, on the target and um, if there are, and effectively all the pod is being copied with, with its uh, all other containers that are in that pod uh, being copied and recreated on the target. So if there are pluggable interfaces there, these should be connected there as well. I mean, there are all kinds of nuances. Uh, it depends on the CNI and, uh, and whatnot. So it's uh, not an easy question to answer here. 
Does Cooper integrate with Spire for workload identity management? For uh, Spire now? Spire, the Spiffy protocol? I'm not sure. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, I have a question uh, about the Windows OS. Uh, so what are the enhancements you're working on making the Windows guest OS, you know, working smoothly? Uh, <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, so we already support uh, Windows guest OS uh, um, pretty well. Uh, there are um, uh, drivers, uh, versatile drivers for, uh, for Windows. Uh, but uh, as we go, we also develop uh, our support for VBS. And um, um, yeah, there, there are all kind of nuances for, you know, for this nested virtualization aspect uh, of Windows. But uh, yeah, there are some... There, there, How is some... Microsoft co co partnering with you on this? Or how is microsoft uh, is, is microsoft fully aligned on all this uh, different uh, yes as operas? you've seen uh, microsoft is one of the adopters of kubert okay. and um, yeah we, we are happy for their their contribution as well thank you uh, i was curious on your the resource quota issues yeah. you're running into and i was wondering if you all have looked into q because like you actually do support uh, pod readiness gates with Q, and I know that Q was kind of created to overcome a lot of existing problems with resource quotas. So it's the uh, dynamic uh, dynamic uh, quota. It's kind of the batch scheduling kind of thing. Well, uh, Q supports pods also, so it, yeah. it does have uh, scheduling gates at that level too. And I was just curious if you have been thinking about like more people requesting virtual machines than you have capacity on your cluster. And I know you're probably using resource quotas and that, but it sounds like it's kind of a little bit inflexible. For yeah, some... um, we didn't look into this, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to, to take it with me. Um, to the Spiffy Spire question, um, I've got a prototype of uh, injecting Spiffy stuff in through VSOC. Yeah. Uh, and it's working with Qbert. So if you want to look on the, the Spiffy Slack channel and uh, talk about it, uh, there's options. Perfect. Uh, hi. Uh, so I have a question about uh, the liveness of the VM during live migration. So does Qbert uh, introduce any uh, additional overhead in terms of live migration when compared to the baseline? Um, because I, I couldn't find any numbers online, so it'd be... Uh, are you speaking about uh, like a CPU consumption and memory consumption, or, or like a network overhead and things uh, like this? So specifically memory, um, and also uh, the network to uh, the downtime and the total migration time. Um, downtime. Uh, so, I mean, it, it really depends on the. Uh, um, I guess on the uh, on, on CNI what what is being used. I, I, sorry, are you asking about the, the networking aspect of it? It's just the... Maybe. No, no, when you mean live migration, it's yeah. the downtime of the VM, that is the application running inside the VM. Yeah. So uh, my question is, how live is it uh, when you do the live migration? So it's uh, as live as it could be. Uh, the downtime is, uh, is reduced to minimum. And uh, if this is a uh, pre-copy migration, then the downtime is about... Uh, 400 milliseconds and maybe even less. Um, so it doesn't affect, it doesn't uh, disconnect um, the clients in the middle. Uh, although there are, it, it also, it, from Kubert perspective, it doesn't disconnect, but it really, uh, the integration in the broader ecosystem, so how um, uh, you, clients are being connected to Kubernetes, and then uh, this is being routed to, uh, to Kubert, uh, that also can, but in general, in terms of uh, VM workload, um, there's no much downtime. Uh, there are a few strategies of how to migrate. Uh, there's a pre-copy that may take more time, and there's a post-copy where we do a little bit of pre-copy, and then, uh, sorry, we, we do pre-copy at the beginning, and then uh, we switch to post-copy where the target uh, is actually becoming the active, um, the active part, and then uh, we copy the pages uh, from the source uh, um, 
and like in a lazy, uh, a lazy uh, copy. But in, in, in terms of downtime. Thanks. Sure. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much.